Good morning, Parker. How many people? Four? Good morning, people at home. Let's all say that together to them, okay? Good morning, people at home. All right, we'll do that every Sunday. Uh, there are some announcements in the bulletin. Don't forget to do this or mark it with your phone. Don't ask me how to do that. I don't know how to do that, so I write mine out. We have some announcements. Pastor Alex has a Bible study Wednesdays at 1 o'clock. Uh, everyone is welcome. I had a bad day this morning. I couldn't get dressed. Then I got in the car and I'd forgotten my walker, so I had to go back in and get the walker and come back out. Then my grandson parked my car right next to the grass, and I can't walk on grass, so it took me five minutes to get up the side of the car. Just not a good day for me, so keep me in prayer. Uh, Parker Choir meets right after the Bible study on Wednesdays at 2.30. Have some open chairs. We can put more chairs out here for you if you need it, so come on down. Uh, today, right after church, for members of the church, we're going to vote on whether we're going to join the Global Methodist Church or not. We need to have that all in place by November 12th. And November 12th is a special annual conference, and we're going to be on a Zoom meeting, and that's when they're going to vote on whether we can disassociate or not. So you might want to be here for that. Uh, Prayers, prayers Monday, every Monday at 9 a.m. That's not the only time you can pray, but that's when you can come pray with everybody here. So come down for that. Does anybody else have a, an announcement we need to make? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we invite you into the church today. Be with each and every one of us. Help us to confess our sins so that we can be one with you and one with each other. We pray this in your name. Amen. Now we have a call to worship. Let's stand for the call to worship. If you can. God gives us one day at a time. Long enough for silence and prayer. Praise God for the time we are given. A time to build a bridge of forgiveness. All righty. What are we doing next? Singing. Okay. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen.
Amen. Nobody knows the trouble I see, but Jesus does. Let us recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's an awesome, beautiful day. And even though we have a day of decision making today, God is here. He's with us today, and he seeks our praise and worship. He knows your heart. He sees your tears. He knows your laughters and your joys. He knows the prayers, even if you didn't put them down in print. They are written on your heart. He knows who you are. He knows your name from the day you were born. He knows the day that you will be going home to be with him. For those who seek him, they will find him. I I have in my hand several prayer requests. Pastor Alex, Uncle James, who's 92 years old, he's in the hospital, so we'll pray for Pastor Alex's uncle. We'll pray for the healing of Ray Lawrence. We pray for Dick Hughes. We pray for Mary Lou Dodson, who has had bad headaches of late, and pray that she would be free from this pain and will be able to be with us in church today again to worship. And yes, we do lift up our world and our nation. And we pray for Abigail's friends, the friends of the granddaughter who is 11 years old, who has leukemia. And as such, we want to start this time of celebration and worship that we together as a body of Christ of the same mind and heart, we pray for revival We pray for restoration of faith. We pray that the dead will come alive in Jesus' name. We pray for the healing of our circumstances, that they would change. We pray for our perspective to put our faith in God. We pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. We pray for a breakthrough that would happen today and miracles in our lives in Jesus name. We thank you God for answers prayer. And I know that Schmidt and I and many people alongside us has had a prayer for our daughter Kelly for so many years. And we thank you for the answer that came to her. And we thank you that she can walk with her head high, know that she has received forgiveness And she could get on with her life. And I thank you, Lord, because it all is in his hands and in his time. Come believe it. Come receive it. In Jesus' name. And now our pastor will pray. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah.
For those watching from home, if you couldn't hear uh, Clara, she also lifted up um, her sister-in-law, Mary Smith. It's good to see you here this morning. Um, We were praying for you Wednesday. Who was that? Bruce, did you get a text or someone did during Bible study? And we just, it was wonderful. We stopped Bible study to pray for you. Don't know if you knew that, but we prayed for you. And that just goes for everybody at home. Please keep us informed because we do love you and we'll keep you in our prayers. And for your doctor visits and everything you're going through, know that your church family is here for you. Thank you for remembering your sister-in-law. And, and if you didn't hear also, Clara mentioned uh, uh, Charlotte Wiggins, the family. I think minus Charlotte has has COVID. And so that's a hard thing to go through. And so let's keep that family in prayer as well. Let's uh, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Good and gracious God. Kathy's right. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We know right now it's, it's beautiful and sunshiny on the outside, but, but we also know weather can change quickly. We're probably going to get a lot of rain this week to the nourishment of our earth. But Lord, uh, despite the weather, we know that on the inside, not only in this church, but in our human bodies, our bodies are a temple, that we are to be sun shining for you and praising you at all times. Even when our bodies give out, our souls are strong, Lord, until you take our souls home. So we pray for all these prayer concerns, those, Lord, that are recovering from injuries, Lord, those that are sick, like Claire said, for those that um, are, are, are facing surgery, those that are recovering from surgery, Lord, even my own uncle, as he's not doing well uh, in Alabama, we ask, Lord, for your prayer and comfort on him. Lord, and uh, for many things that our, our church uh, family is going through, things that are spoken and unspoken, Lord, we just lift it up to you. And Lord, you, you taught a parable that, that in this parable you said, Lord, that we are to be consistent in our prayers every day, just like the widow that went to the judge that asked for, for justice from her adversary. Lord, perhaps there's some kind of spiritual adversary that is in our lives that we, we just need to cut the, uh, the apron cord and, and let us move on, not only with our personal lives, professional lives, whatever it is, Lord, that's hindering us. Lord, we present it before you with all authority, claiming in the name of Jesus that we're more than conquerors and that you're going to help us through whatever it is we're going through today. Lord, if anyone's here or anyone at home, Lord, give them the reassurance of the Holy Spirit that you are there to, to love them, just like a, a mother uh, a coddles a, a newborn baby. We ask, Lord, that you just, just love us and guide us in all that we do as we continue to move forward for you and your kingdom uh, here on earth. And this we ask in your name when you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Ushers, I'm going to ask us if you prepare yourselves as we prepare ourselves for this morning's offering. Ushers.
Please pray with me. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the sunshine. It is so beautiful out there. The temperatures are coming down and we can get out more. But Father, most of all, we thank you for the ability to move forward. This church is growing and we're moving forward, Lord. We ask you to be with us today as we make our decision of which way to go. Father, you have given us so much. You have blessed us so much. And we have a small portion to give back to you, Lord. We ask you to accept it graciously. Humbly we offer it. Father, we ask you to multiply it. Use it wisely. Show us how to spend it wisely, Lord. We want to build your kingdom and glorify you in all things. Amen. children would like to come forward, I think we're going to have a children's message. Hey, good morning, kids. You can have a seat right there. Hey, you know, when I was in elementary school, I had this piggy bank. It's bigger than this. It's probably almost the size of this bucket that has a lot of money in it, by the way. And this piggy bank I had, my dad took me to a a Kmart or a TGY. I forget which it was back then. We didn't have a Walmart. And we pulled up to the parking lot, and my dad said, well, son, you have a piggy bank full of change. What are you going to do with it? And I said, well, that's why we're here, Dad. I like to go inside and buy me some action figures, you know what I mean, like little army men, things like that. I really wanted it and had my eye on it. I've been saving for a long time with my own money to go buy me some action figures, little little army men to play with. And he said, well, do you think that's a wise use of your money? And I said, yes, sir, I think it's a wise use of my money. I was just a kid. I wanted it, you know. And he goes, well, here's your bank. And by the way, it was sealed. He had to open it with a hammer. I couldn't get into it. And I'd been saving a long time. And he said, I'm going to give you the choice. You can go in and buy you some toys, 
or you can use the money and and donate it to the church. And he goes, what would you like to do? And I, I was, I didn't know what to do. What do you think I did? Did you think I went in and bought some toys, or did you think I gave it to the church? I gave it to the church. Same thing as when I said you. The, the girl said I, I gave it to the church, but guess what? No, I did. I gave it to the church. Because I was scared my dad was going to spank me if I didn't. <laughs> I was more scared. I was thinking ahead. I was a good leader back then. If I, if I go buy toys, I, I, I might get my dad's wrath. But no, he wouldn't spank me. He just gave me a choice. I want you to hold that. See how heavy it is. Is it, is it too heavy? Let your sister hold it. See how heavy it is. Now, if you're wondering, how did I collect this, all these coins so fast? It's because I used to live in Los Angeles. And this is crazy, but anywhere you park in Los Angeles, guess what you got to have? You got to have change to park anywhere. It's like in Parker, you ride around, you just pull up and you're fine, you know. But in Los Angeles, you had to have all this change with you. A lot of this change I don't need anymore, so I just I sort of kept it as a souvenir. But I said, you know what? I'm going to donate it to missions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something with you guys that my dad did, okay? You can have this nickel. It's all yours. You can have this nickel. It's all yours. I'm going to put this in here. And after we get through praying, you decide what you want to do with that nickel. Okay? You can take it home. <laughs> or you can put it right here. But, but don't worry. I'm not going to look. But they are. Okay? So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for missions. And these coins that help people around the world. And these coins that help people around the world. Bless it now. Bless it now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not looking. Good morning. This morning's uh, reading is from Nehemiah 6, verses 15 and 16. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elo, in, in 52 days. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God.
Well, good morning again, church family. It's good to see all of you here today. And if you're watching from home, good morning to you as well. And know that we love you. And if you have your bulletin, you can open it and follow along in the middle. There is an outline if you would like to take notes. And if you're at home, I believe the outline will be provided on your screen. Today's message is entitled, Moving Forward, Part 2. Now, this ends the two-sermon, two-part sermon series on moving forward. But before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer using a prayer borrowed from our founder, John Wesley, the covenant prayer. Let us pray. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering, let me be put to work for you or set aside for you, praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full and let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O wonderful, glorious God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be so in heaven. Amen. Keep moving forward. The early church kept moving forward. They had no choice because they were being persecuted. It faced a lot of challenges, just like our churches do around the world today. And no matter what comes our way at Parker... We will move forward because we know that God is going to deliver us and that we'll keep following Jesus. Amen. You know, in February 2007 in in central Florida, a, a tornado hit this hit this city and it, it left behind a 30 mile path of destruction. And in its wake, 20 people were killed. After the tornado had passed through, the people gathered in the church parking lot. Even the church was destroyed, and it was built to survive a Category 4 hurricane, but all they saw was twisted wood and metal. And as they, they loved on each other, hugged on each other, prayed for each other, and cried for one another, they knew they were going to be able to move forward. The following Sunday, the pastor had a worship service out in the parking lot because the building was not safe to meet in. And as he gathered in the parking lot with all the parishioners, a lot of people came together at that church and even TV stations came out and filmed the worship service. And this is how the pastor began his service with these words. This is just a building. You are the church. We will be back stronger and bigger than ever because we have survived the storm. We will keep moving forward. And those are my words of encouragement to all of us today. We're going to keep moving forward No matter what kind of storms of life may come our way, we're going to keep moving forward using the Nehemiah model that Bruce read to you earlier. And there are three points that I've provided in the bulletin that I'd like for you to follow along with and take notes. The number one is purpose. Nehemiah had a purpose in what he was doing for moving forward. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. And number two was The outlook. What was the outlook of the people and as Nehemiah, as they came together to move forward? And number three was the perception of people outside of Nehemiah's circle that those he was leading. What was the perception of the community of them as they were moving forward? These are all great points. I'm going to address them. But let's start first with number one, and that is... The purpose. God gave Nehemiah and the people a purpose to to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. 
It was more than just rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. It was rebuilding their spiritual lives. For you see, they had been taken in exile and they were exported away. But now it was time to not only rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, but to rebuild their spiritual lives and start moving forward in the right direction. So what's so amazing about this wall is that when Nehemiah received this purpose, it only took Nehemiah and those within Jerusalem how many days to rebuild the walls? 52 days to rebuild the walls. Do you know how long it, it had laid in ruins? For over 70 years it laid in ruins. But in 52 days, they rebuilt the walls because they knew their God cannot be mocked. God was driving this purpose. And not only were they rebuilding the walls in a defensive posture, but it was about rebuilding their lives, not only in society, but to also rebuild their lives spiritually because this was when they were going to rebuild the second temple. What we have to remember is that, yes, this was a purpose that Nehemiah had for his people, but it really wasn't his purpose. The purpose came from who? It was a God-driven purpose that they were to move forward. You see, God is the God of order, not disorder. When you read the book of Genesis, it said God created something out of chaos. Can you imagine God's chosen people looking down at Jerusalem, seeing this city just in ruins, God's saying to himself, I, I'm not going to let my people live like this forever. These are my chosen people. I, I don't like seeing the walls down. I don't like seeing the homes destroyed. And, and this temple that David built for me through his son, Solomon, there's no way I'm going to allow to continue to allow us to be mocked by our enemies. I'm going to give Nehemiah a purpose to move forward with the people. This was a God-driven purpose. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 9 through 10 says this, God himself took charge of his people and became their fortress. You see, it was more than just building a wall. It was about rebuilding their lives from the inside out. See, our bodies, as we study Jesus in the New Testament, is the temple. And God dwells there within. You see, Nehemiah and these people, they weren't trying to pick a fight by filling in the gap, by building the walls, by building the gates. They weren't looking for a fight. The fight had come to them. Now, this was a defensive posture, and God was going to move them forward. During these 52 days of rebuilding the walls in Jerusalem, the people still worship God, Scripture says. So on the Sabbath, they didn't even work building the walls. What they did was rested and worshipped God. That is amazing, isn't it? The people were united for one purpose, and that was to serve God and do what God was asking them to do. They were in one accord in everything they were doing, and they did it cheerfully. Hmm? Now, you may be wondering, what was the perimeter like of Jerusalem for building these walls? Well, of course, Jerusalem had been sacked and the temple had been destroyed. Everything was in ruins. So they didn't need to expand the wall to as, to as uh, wide as what David did when he, he built the wall westward. It was enough to get them through what God wanted to. So this perimeter around Jerusalem was about, about two and a half miles wide, protecting 220 acres. But it was more than walls, it was more than property. These were God's people, and God was about to show up and show out to those that wanted to stop them from moving forward. What I find fascinating about this text is that some me people may, may gloss over some of the words that Bruce read. If you look back at our text again, in verse 15, you see the word Elul, E-L-U-L. -L. The wall was completed in the month of Elul. 
It's the last month of the Jewish calendar year. I guess that would be, let me use an analogy, it would be like December for us, right? Go like this, we'll get out of here sooner. So you got December connecting November to December from de December to what? January. So it's a connection. Elo was the connection of the last month of the Jewish calendar year connecting the old to the new. And it says it was, it was completed in the month of Elel, the last month of the calendar year. It was connecting the, the upcoming year from the old. They were moving forward. So how much symbolism is that right there that they had finished on the last month of the Jewish calendar year? In the same way, as we move forward in our personal lives, for our church, whatever it is that God is working with you, we thank God not only for our 120 plus year past of what our family members and ancestors and preachers and district superintendents and bishops and everyone that got us to the point, we thank God for that, for them, but we also thank God for moving us forward for what God wants us to do because God has given each of us a, 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 a God-driven purpose to move forward because we know that God is delivering us. We know it within our heart of hearts and that we will keep following Jesus. Amen. Now this takes us to our second point. Our outlook, you know, some of you may have heard of Jack Welch. Jack Welch became the youngest CEO and chairman of the company General Electric at the age of 46 years old. He had a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a doctorate. I believe it was in chemistry. But he really wanted the company to keep moving forward and do great things in America. But in order to do so... He had a vision. He had to take the company and the employees where they needed to go. And what did Jack Welch do? Here's this educated man, the youngest CEO and chairman of General Electric's uh, uh, lifetime at the age of 46. What he wanted to do was simplify everything in the company from the top down and from the bottom up. Everybody was on the same sheet of music. Got everybody moving in the same direction. And by doing so, not only did he have a successful career, but so did General Electric as they moved in the right direction. And here's a quote from Jack Welch. A good leader remains focused. Controlling your direction is better than being controlled by it. Amen? He did this by keeping the main thing the main thing. Let me ask you something, Parker. What is the main thing for us? Do we need to simplify or do we need to overcomplicate? Do we think too much or do we just need to remember the main thing is the Word of God? Once you start getting away from the Word of God, what you start doing is going in circles. You know, they say insanity is doing the same thing over and over and never getting a better result. Hey, listen, we need to move forward in unity, have a great outlook, and what is it that God is driving us to do? I think it always has to start, start with the Word of God. If you start focusing on social issues, social issues become your God. Our God is Jesus Christ. We have to move forward with God. God is the one who delivers us, not social issues. And while social issues are important, we praise God for that. And I believe today, was the day that Martin Luther King Jr. gave his speech when he says, I have a dream that my children will be judged by the uh, content of their character and not by the color of their skin. So today I ask you, what is it that you want to have for this church? What kind of outlook do you want? From years from now, people are going to say, you know what, what a great outlook Parker had. We'll talk more about that in point number two when we get to it. Brothers and sisters, we've got to move forward. We've got to keep the main thing the main thing. And that is starting first with the Word of God. And if we stray from it, realize that we won't be blessed. But if we stay focused on the Word of God, God will continue to bless us, our children, and our children's children, and generations to come. And there's two objectives to get there. I said this last week in part one of our series, and I'll say it again today. Two objectives. Number one, God will deliver us. And number two, we've got to follow Jesus. That's simple. 
we are asking you to dream again and move our church forward to be a blessing to this community, to all the communities that center around Parker. If you look at a map, you'll notice that Parker is right dead in the center. We're surrounded by Springfield. We're surrounded by Lynn Haven, by Callaway. We're, we're right in the middle. We lead right from the middle. Highway 98 is right out there. People go this way left and right to go to Tyndall Air Force Base, Mexico City Beach, St. Port St. Joe. We are right here in the middle and God has a purpose for us. What is it? What is it that God has put on your heart? What has God put on your brain to share with us? Hmm? 30 years from now, people may not remember any of us sitting right here. Matter of fact, some of us may not even be here 30 years from now. But what we're talking about is the future, not necessarily today. And if we continue to follow God's direction, having a positive outlook on what God wants us to do, it, it sort of reminds me of an old quote that I saw when I was stationed out in California. Um, he was one of our presidents named Ronald Reagan. He once said this, there's no, there's no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. Huh? In his book, To Dream Again, Robert Dale says that a healthy congregation continues to move forward. On the other hand, an unhealthy congregation starts out as a movement, but then becomes a monument. Do you want to keep moving? Do you want to keep moving the church forward? I don't think we'll ever obtain what it is we're going after because Paul says to strive for the prize. And that's what I'm going to be studying, what we'll be studying next week in a new series called Eyes on the Prize. But we should never be satisfied. We should always be in perpetual motion for Jesus Christ. We are of movement. But the moment we start resting on our laurels, we become a monument. Hmm? We are more than a monument. We are a living church. We don't want to survive for God. We want to thrive for God. We want to thrive for God because 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, Together, we are the body of Christ. Each of you is part of his body. I truly believe in the days and months ahead, we are going to awaken spiritual giants within this congregation. Our outlook for the kingdom of God must be focused on kingdom building. And how do we kingdom build? By saving lives. We don't save them. People come here to get saved. It's Jesus Christ that saves people. We should always continue to point people to the cross. Maybe that's our God-given purpose like Nehemiah had when he was rebuilding the walls. Perhaps that is something that we need to look at in the mirror today. As Nehemiah asked those in Jerusalem, we need to rebuild not only our spiritual lives, but we also need to fill in the gap and help those that are struggling. But our number one goal should always be the Word of God. <coughs> Nehemiah kept the people focused. He kept the people focused on God. That was the outlook. And while building the walls and the gates to Jerusalem were awesome, Nehemiah knew that it wasn't his purpose, it was God's driven purpose. Let me ask you, church, let me ask you something. Do we have any Nehemiahs in here today? Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Like Kathy said, we should all be Nehemiahs looking to rebuild or repair or make better not only ourselves for God's glory, but for those that we come in contact with. This is the Nehemiah model. We are not only trying to do something great for the kingdom of God and declare victory in the face of of spiritual storms that came, come our way, but we are also trying to say that our outlook is on God and salvation. Romans 1.16 says this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ 
because it is the power of salvation for all who believe, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. We are the Gentiles. We are the Gentiles because when Jesus said in Matthew 28 to go make disciples of all the world, that means outside Jerusalem, outside of Israel, outside of the Middle East. It started forming and moving, a movement to Rome with the Apostle Paul, so on and so forth until it reached Parker, Parker, Florida. Now, this takes us to our third and final point today, and that's the perception of our church. In verse 16 of our text, it says, They perceived that this work was done by our God. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the Amplified Bible, it says that the enemies of the Jews lost their confidence, for they recognized that this work had been accomplished by the help of our God. See, what I'm saying is this. It wasn't so much that the enemies that were looking on the outside in as Nehemiah helped build the walls with the people. It was that the people were crediting God. So it wasn't, oh, wow, look how great Nehemiah is. Oh, wow, look how good the people are. Oh, wow, look how fast they're moving. No, that's not it. It it was a movement by God and those on the outside looking in, they had a perception that. God's hand is on the favor of Nehemiah and the people. So even the enemies had a perception and they were praising God. And that's all that we want for our church. We want people on the outside looking in, no matter where they're at, to say this, God is at that church. God is at Parker. There's nothing else going on there. No infighting, no this, no that. God is at that church. That's the perception we want. That's the way it should be anyways, right? When you see a cross in the church, you would think that God should be there. But that's the perception we have to work toward. Brothers and sisters, as we continue to move forward, God's going to open doors for us and give us new ways to minister. I mean, several of you in here, I think one of them just went back with the uh, 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 the children's Sunday school, A few people have been going over to Tyndall Air Force Base. I don't know if you knew this or not. Good on them. They've been taking snacks, goodies, and dropping it off over there uh, at least four times that I can think of, top of my head. And then the perception that they're getting over there is that, hey, this is a friendly church. You know, We're, we're not necessarily trying to apostolicize and bring them in. All we're trying to do is show God's love. The perception they have is between God and them. But our job is to follow Matthew 28, to go out and make disciples. So the perception that the enemies had of the people, that was because they felt convicted of what they were thinking. What we want people to think about our church is that this is a God-driven, God-purposeful church moving forward. More importantly than anything else is that I want you as individuals when you come in this church, from this pulpit, from this choir, from those that speak, that you see Jesus, that you can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of perception we always want to give, that Christ is our Savior. Or as the prophet Isaiah said in chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? The Lord is an eternal God, the creator of earth. He never gets weary or tired. His his wisdom is unmeasurable. The Lord gives strength to those who are weary. Even young people get tired. They stumble like eagles soaring upward on wings. They will walk and run without getting tired. We have full confidence in the Lord that our God will navigate us through the future. We must stay the course. God is our lead pilot, and we are his wingmen. Wherever God leads, we are going to follow. But we must stick together as we move forward. Yes, we must take a stand against those who teach false doctrines, contrary to the word of God. The disciples had to do this. Jesus died for it. 
and we're no different. However, we should also get along as a church family and show love, kindness, and respect to one another. Or as sometimes the old saying goes that was coined by John Wesley himself, sometimes we just have to agree to disagree. Philippians 2, 14 through 16 says, Do everything readily and cheerfully. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. Carry the light-giving message into the night so I'll have good cause to be proud of you when Christ returns. Don't let my work be in vain. 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 24 says, Run after mature righteousness, faith, love, and peace, joining those who are in honest and serious prayer, before God, refuse to get involved in meaningless discussions. They always end up in fights. God's servants must not be argumentative, but a gentle listener. And what about Proverbs 29, 22? Just a dose a day will keep the devil away, as my mom says from Proverbs. Angry people stir up discord. Mm. They, the intemperament, stir up trouble. Oh, and speaking of my mother, here's one from my mother. Kill them with kindness. Huh. In closing, have you wondered where, have you ever wondered where pearls come from? And I'm not talking about you, Miss Pearl. Are the, those in your earrings there? Or your necklace? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, pearls are grown on trees, right? Some people are going, yes. <laughs> See, you got to test the preacher. No, they don't come from trees. Uh, they are produced inside an oyster, right? Okay. It's painful for the oyster because this is how it begins. Sand gets inside the oyster and it starts to rub the oyster the wrong way. The oyster doesn't like it because the sand is just irritating it. It's like, oh gosh, I have an irritant inside here. I, I don't like it. The oyster is just so irritated. Over time, a biological process takes place that happens inside the oyster, and it becomes, after all this irritation, it becomes, and it is formed into a what? A beautiful pearl inside the oyster. Even though the oyster had to go through some irritation with, with the sand that was rubbing it the wrong way, a lot of challenges, it is through the suffering and paying that something beautiful is born. In the same way, I truly believe that our best days are ahead of us, Parker. We may get some sand inside the church, you know what I mean? And it's going to rub us the wrong way. But I guarantee you the Holy Spirit is going to give something, is going to, is going to birth something beautiful out of 908 South Tyndall Parkway. Amen? And how do I know that? Because we are going to what? Move forward. Let us pray. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if the Holy Spirit is talking to you this morning, it might be time to give your life to God or rededicate your life to God. If so, say this prayer just to yourself, not out loud. Dear Jesus, for too long I've kept you out of my life. Uh, too much sand has gotten on the inside of me. It's irritated me. It's rubbed me the wrong way. I choose, Lord, to get this sand out of my life because I have the Holy Spirit. Lord, make me something beautiful in your sight. I accept you as Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Thank you for saving me with your love and your grace that I don't deserve. Please forgive me. And if you said that prayer, you've been born again. You have a new home in heaven, and your name's been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand for our closing song? And if you would like to come forward during the closing song uh, to join this church family by a confession of faith or a transfer of membership, we invite you to come. Will you please stand?
Uh, receive the benediction. Go in peace in the name of the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before you go, if you want to stick behind, if you'll please just take a seat, and we have a quick announcement. Bruce? Okay, we're going to, for members, going to vote today as to whether or not we go into the GMC. We'll give out cards.